We start with the hypervolume. There are several references on the hypervolume if you want to know more. Uh, some of these are algorithms like this one. Uh, it's a very well known algorithm. Uh, others are more theoretical like this one. But there are lots of references on this. The hypervolume has been studied by many, many people. Okay, next indicator is the error ratio. This is a very old indicator as well proposed by Bell Doysen in his uh, PhD thesis in 99. And in here, you see ER is equals to this summation of E divided by N. N is the number of solutions we have in the true Pareto front. And E is basically uh, takes either 1 or 0. It takes 0 if it's in the true Pareto front and 1 if it's not. So obviously the ideal will be that this value is zero. If, if the value is zero, that means everybody, all the points we obtain are in the, uh, in the true Pareto form. So this error ratio is defined as the proportion of non-true Pareto points in our approximation. It is a reference indicator because we need the true Pareto form. That's the reference set. Without the true Pareto form, we, we, there is no way we can know this. It induces total ordering, and it's cardinal. It's cardinal because it counts how many solutions. For example, if I have 100 points, it will tell me you know, 50 of those 100 are in the, uh, in the true Pareto front. The other 50 are not. It will give me a number. It is only weakly compatible with OC, not with OW. Remember, OW is the good one. It is not weakly compatible with any of the other two, OS or OW. Because, for example, if an algorithm finds two non dominant vectors, one in the true Pareto front and another far from the true Pareto front, then the error ratio will be 0.5. And if it finds 100 solutions from which 99 are very close and one which is in the true Pareto front, then the error ratio will be 0.99. So it's, a, it's heavily biased. And this indicator nobody uses anymore. It was used several years ago. We used it in my group for some years. But the problem is, is the bias. Just counting is, is not good enough because strange situations may happen. So the, uh, the example there is, this is my true Pareto front. And remember, the indicator is counting how many solutions are in the Pareto front. So it may happen that I have many, they are very well distributed. I am covering the whole Pareto front. But none of them is on the true Pareto front. So in this case, I will get zero, right? I will get, I'm sorry, 99, I will get, or 100. That is very bad. The error rate is very bad. But if you plot this Pareto front, it looks a very good approximation. However, if I have another approximation in which I have these points are in the Pareto front, and all the others are very far, very bad distribution, this one is better than this one according to this indicator. So that's, that's the problem. It doesn't give me much information about the, uh, the behavior of the algorithm or the performance. It, it's sort of an absolute measure. So it uh, also violates relativity because any non-empty subset of the Pareto optimal set has an optimal error ratio. But it exhibits weak relativity because the Pareto front itself is evaluated not worse than any other set. This is a very old picture, very rare picture. Uh, this is from 2003, long time ago. The, the guy in the middle is myself, of course. This is uh, David Van Beldoysen and, and Gary Lamont. These are my co-authors of the book. We, we wrote this book in 2002. Second edition was published in 2007. But we have met in person probably only three maximum four times in our lives, uh, the three of us. I, I, I used to see Gary Lamont 
uh, at many conferences uh, some time ago. Now he doesn't go to conference anymore because his wife died some years ago. He's not traveling that much. And he's always complaining he doesn't get funding from his university in, in Ohio. And, and David, uh, he was a, a pilot of the Air Force, the US Air Force. And he retired from, from the uh, Air Force and now works in uh, some place also owned by the, by the Air Force as a consultant but I don't get to see him anymore. So it's uh, one of those. This picture was taken outside a restaurant in, in Indiana, in Indianapolis, in, in the year 2003, when we attended a conference on, uh, on swarm, swarm intelligence. So it's, it's, uh, it brings back a lot of memories. So advantages, the error ratio is easy to understand. It's easy to calculate. Any student can do this. It is a scaling independent. Uh, it can be used in some cases as a quick and rough means of, of having an idea of how we're doing in terms of convergence. The disadvantage, of course, you need to know the true Pareto front, and it is not a reliable measure because it's incompatible with the outperform, uh, outperformance relations. Generational distance. This is an interesting indicator because it, it was totally forgotten by the world. And I told you yesterday the story of the inverted generational uh, distance, which is now a very famous indicator. Uh, and it's only a very simple variation of this one. The original one was proposed also by David in 1999 in his PhD thesis. It's a very simple indicator. You see this D here is an Euclidean distance. It's the Euclidean distance between each member in our approximation and the closest member in the true Pareto front. So we measure this, we divide this by n, which is the number of solutions in our approximation, and this gives me the generational distance. Obviously, a value of zero means all my solutions are on the true Pareto optimal front. Uh, and the larger this value is, it means I'm farther away from, from converging to the Pareto optimal front. However, it is a highly biased indicator, as I mentioned yesterday. I gave you an example in which it doesn't work. Uh, it's a reference measure because it requires, again, the true Pareto front. It induces a total ordering, and it's non-cardinal. It's not counting things. It's giving me a real number, which is this Euclidean distances. It can be very misleading because it's very easy to produce examples in which we get an inappropriate result. Yesterday, I showed you, I showed you an example. There are some other extreme examples of, of the uh, misuse of generational distance. The example I showed you yesterday, if you remember, was that we had the Pareto front, and I had very few points, but they were very close from each other. So if I compute GD here, it's going to give me a very good value, as opposed to having an approximation that covers all the Pareto front, but has some holes. For example, I have some here, some here. So this is very close, but since they are not at the same distance, all these points that are farther apart are going to be highly penalized by the indicator because the closest point is going to be very far and, and I will get a worse value. So something that intuitively is a better approximation is going to get a worse value in the indicator. So it's not a good indicator. It's, it's no longer used. Nobody uses generational distance anymore, but it was used for some years. So it's not weakly compatible with OW, but it is with OS. It violates uh, weak monotony because GD favors, for example, one vector close to the two Pareto front over a set containing that vector plus others, as long as the others are not closer on average to the two Pareto front. This is an example like the one I put. It doesn't exhibit uh, weak relativity because any subset of the two Pareto front has an optimal generational distance. So advantages is for a constant size of the non-dominated set, GD is compatible with OS, computing the Euclidean distance, as you know, is, is very efficient to do, so it's cheap to calculate. Disadvantages, since it is not compatible with OW, 
it cannot be reliable. It's, it cannot be used confidently for non-dominated sets that are changing in cardinality, which is something that, that may happen. Also, it is required to know the true Pareto front of, of the problem. And this indicator will either add or multiply different objectives together, which introduces same as the hypervolumes on scaling issues. It's just hypervolume is scaling independent. This one is not. Then we have inverted generational distance. I already told you this story yesterday. It was developed by the suggestion of a reviewer we had of, of a paper that we finally managed to publish in the year 2005. Actually, that is a very interesting paper because it's the first artificial immune system designed for multi-objective optimization based on Pareto optimality. In that paper, they, uh, they told us that if GD had so many problems, why didn't we use uh, the opposite measure from the true Pareto front to the approximation? And that makes a big difference. If, if you measure in the opposite direction, then this indicator has really nice properties because it can assess not only convergence, but also spread, same as the hypervolume. However, it has one advantage with respect to the hypervolume that this uh, indicator is very expensive, is very inexpensive, even if you apply it in high dimensionality, in problems with 10 objectives, for example. So today, everybody is using this indicator in many objective optimization, because hypervolume, it can be applied, of course, but it's expensive, and other indicators cannot be applied. Most of the other convergence indicators are not applicable, and IGD is applicable. It's, it's a very good indicator, and actually some people have analyzed the behavior of the indicator, uh, and they found out that it has some, some really interesting properties in spite of the fact that it's not Pareto compliant. That means it's not compatible with OW, the, uh, the relation I put here. But that is because it's based on Euclidean distances. But in spite of that disadvantage, in general, it's a very reliable indicator. This sounds strange, but it's very, very reliable. So many people use it, and, and many people are happy with the, uh, with the performance of, of the indicator. Same as GD, in IGD, if you get zero or a very small value, that means your approximation is very good. The higher the value of IGD, the worse your approximation is. So when comparing with another algorithm, whoever has lower IGD values is a better algorithm. So it's a, it's a nice indicator. It's very inexpensive. Actually, IGD was used in 2004 for the first time. It was used in a paper we published in a conference. But uh, the definition of the indicator was provided in, in 2005. So, as I say, IGD can assess not only convergence, but also spread. And it has been used a lot in, in many objective uh, optimization. So this is the paper that I told you about. This is uh, about uh, an artificial immune system for multi-objective optimization. It was published in a journal called Genetic Programming and Evolvable Machines. It's a journal that specializes in genetic programming. More recently, Hisao Ichibuchi, he proposed a very interesting variant of IGD, which is weakly Pareto compliant. His idea is really very simple. He, he proposed to modify the distance calculation between a solution and a reference point by taking into account Pareto dominance. So if a solution is dominated by a reference point, then he uses the Euclidean distance with no modification. However, if they are non-dominated with respect to each other, he c calculates the minimum distance from the reference point to the dominated region by the solution. It, it's a very small change, but it makes a significant difference because with this change, the indicator becomes uh, weakly Pareto compliant. That means, theoretically, is uh, reliable. Something, however, remarkable, I, I, I attended uh, Hisao's presentation when he, he proposed this indicator, and he showed results obtained with hypervolume, with IGD, and his proposal that is called IGD+. Plus. And there isn't a big difference. Numerically, there isn't a big difference. It's, it's basically what you are buying is reliability. 
but the value, the numerical value, is very similar to the one obtained by IGD and IGD plus, and hypervolume as well. Hypervolume also has some, some problems. So this distance can be viewed as an amount of the inferiority of the solution in comparison with, with the reference point. And only inferior objective values of the solution to the reference point are, are used in this uh, distance uh, calculation. So this is the definition of the indicator. It looks like this. So all this part is, is pretty much the same as I, the original IGD, but he introduces this, uh, the, uh, the Pareto dominance relation here. So he has two cases to compute the distances. So it, the indicator, uh, IGD plus, has some resemblance with the additive version of the epsilon indicator. Uh, because the maximum distance over all reference points is, uh, is calculated the same as in the epsilon indicator. In the epsilon, the epsilon indicator, and I think we will, we will get to see that, is defined in the following way. I have two approximations. This is one point produced by approximation A, by algorithm A, and this is a point produced by algorithm B. Clearly, A is dominating B. So the epsilon indicator is basically how much do I have to displace B so that it's no longer dominated by A. So if I move it here and I put it at the same height, B is no longer dominated by, by A. So this distance is, is the value of the epsilon indicator. So epsilon indicator is related somehow to uh, IGD plus. It's, it's very interesting that. And this is the paper in which he proposed IGD plus, which some people are using. Surprisingly enough, still most people are using IGD, which makes me happy because I get more citations than, than he saw. But eventually, I guess, they will, they will switch. Even in my group, we are using IGD plus, not, not IGD anymore. But nobody else is doing that. It's, that's very strange. Delta P we developed with Oliver Chutze in the picture uh, back in 2012 is, uh, is another interesting variant of GD and IGD. Delta P uh, can be seen as an average house of distance between an approximation set and the Pareto front of a multi-objective problem. And it modifies GD and IGD. So this is the definition, the modified definition of GD that is used. Uh, if you see, is the distance, but now we are dividing between the cardinality of the set, and the whole thing is being raised to the one uh, by, uh, divided by p. The original indicator is a slightly different to this. And the same happens with IGD. IGD, we, we do the same. So I, GD and IGD have weak metric properties. They are non-negative, non-symmetric, and they don't satisfy the relaxed triangle uh, inequality. So delta P is the maximum of these two values. So it has better metric properties than any of the two, than GD or IGD. It is positive and, and, and symmetric, and it's a semi-metric, which is, mathematically speaking, is something really nice. If the magnitudes of the sets are bounded, then the relaxed triangle inequality is satisfied and is a pseudo-metric. If we use p equals to infinity, then it becomes a metric. It's the house door distance. So it's, it's nice. Of course, it's not Pareto compliant because it still uses Euclidean distances, but uh, it has nice uh, properties. Uh, it can be used to guide the search. This is the paper we published in, in Gecko 2012 in which we adapted delta p, we, we put it in the selection mechanism of a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm based on differential evolution, and it worked very nicely. We were able to show that not only the algorithm was able to solve multi-objective problems with two, three objectives uh, being competitive with uh, state-of-the-art algorithms, but also we could use it up to 10 objectives, and it obtained solutions that were within no more than a 5% error 
of the solutions obtained by SMS in MOA with exact hypervolume calculations. And whereas the uh, SMS in MOA took like four or five days to, to get w the solution of this problem with 10 objectives, we could do it in milliseconds. And the error was no larger than 5%. So it was, it was a very, uh, very nice result. But uh, this student, Cynthia, she was my master's student, and, and she went to, uh, to the University of Waterloo to get her PhD in combinatorial optimization. So she totally abandoned evolutionary algorithms. She's not doing metaheuristics anymore. She's doing some theoretical work in there. So another performance indicator is the maximum Pareto front error, also proposed by Bell Doysen. It me measures the largest distance between any vector in our Pareto front approximation and the corresponding closest vector in the true Pareto front. So this can be seen as a variation of the uh, generational distance. So in this case, what we do is we have the true Pareto front, and I have an approximation like this. So I have these points. So I measure for each point the distance to the closest point in the true Pareto optimal front, and I basically take the maximum of those distances, which, for example, in this case is probably this one, and this is the value. How far I am in the, in the largest uh, distance. So obviously, if the largest distance is zero, that means you already converge, right? So that, that's what you want. It's a reference measure because it requires the, two, the true Pareto front. It induces a complete ordering, and it's non-cardinal because it will give you a real value. It's not counting anything. It's not weakly compatible with any relation, violates uh, weak monotony. It is better uh, to find one solution close to the true Pareto front than to find 10, nine of which are in the true Pareto front and the other one is not, which is a problem, right? You could have most of these solutions on the Pareto front, but if you have only one that is farther away, then you get penalized with the indicator. So it's cheap to compute. It provides information about whether any points found are far from the true Pareto front, but it has many disadvantages. Uh, normally, it's highly biased. So even if you get a low value, it doesn't tell you much about the actual performance of the algorithm. And uh, it's not uh, compatible with any of the uh, outperformance relations, which means it's not reliable in any, in any way. Average Pareto front error is a variation of this indicator in which for each solution we uh, find its perpendicular distance to the true Pareto front and, and we use a, uh, a combination of piecewise linear segments with the average of this distance defining the, uh, the metric. So it's the same as this, but in this case you measure this for every point, not just the one that has the maximum value, and you get the average. So this tries to solve the problem with the original indicator, right? That if you, if you only go for the maximum value, then it's highly biased. If you get the average, you will expect this to be a bit better. So um, this is an independent measure, induces a complete ordering, and it's a cardinal measure because this one will tell me, uh, oh no, this is the next one. It has the same problems, this. The next one is the overall non dominant vector generation. This is the one that is cardinal. It, it counts the total number of non dominated vectors found during the execution of, of the algorithm. No, the, it's important to notice here that it's not the number of solutions that are in the true Pareto front. It's just how many solutions you have that are non dominated. That's all it counts. Probably none of these non dominant solutions are in the true Pareto optimal front. So it's independent because it does not require the true Pareto front. It only counts how many solutions you got. It induces a complete ordering, and it's cardinal because it's counted. It's not weakly compatible. It doesn't exhibit, exhibit either weak monotony or weak relativity. It's very easy to compute. It's a scaling independent. But there are, of course, pathological cases 
in which this measure can be highly uh, biased. For example, what happens is if in generation zero, at the beginning of the ex execution of the algorithm, all the solutions are non-dominated. Then you will have a very large value, and apparently your algorithm is doing great. But it's not true. It's not doing great. It's just everybody is non-dominated. That happens, for example, in many objective optimization. The main disadvantage is the lack of Pareto compatibility. And it's uh, straightforward to come up with the scenarios in, in which A outperforms B on this measure, but in which B is clearly better than A. No? For example, if A has one million non-dominated points and B contains just one, but this point dominates all the points in A, it could happen. One algorithm produces many points, but the other algorithm that produces only one, this one point dominates all the others. Then the one that dominates all the others wins, of course. The overall non-dominated vector generation ratio uh, is another variation, also by Van Beldoysen, measures the ratio of the total number of non-dominated vectors found during the execution of the algorithm. So it's the same as before, but now it's normalized by dividing this by the number of solutions in the true Pareto front. In this case, we do need the true Pareto front. So obviously, if we get one, that means we have the exact same number of solutions. That doesn't mean that we reach the true Pareto front. Only means we have the same number of solutions as the true Pareto front, right? If the true Pareto front has 100 and we have 100 non-dominant solutions, the indicator will give me one. That doesn't mean my 100 solutions are in the true Pareto form. Right? It only means it's the same cardinality. That's all. So it requires to know how many solutions we have in the true Pareto form. Some people, for example, this guy shot the, in his master's thesis from MIT. He used this uh, performance indicator but defined in decision variable space. Although counting the number of non-dominant solutions gives some feeling on how effective is the algorithm in generating solutions, it does not reflect how far from the true Pareto front are our solutions. So it's not of much use to know this. So too few, if we have very few vectors and the representation of our Pareto front approximation is very poor, then uh, too many vectors may overwhelm the, the distance measure. So, we can get biased thinking that the algorithm is doing great, but we don't really have any clue about that. So it's difficult to know what a good value will be for, for this indicator. The cardinality of the Pareto front approximation may change. Uh, of course, for comparing, it will be a fixed value, but if we are dealing with real numbers, it, the cardinality is really perhaps infinite. So we just bound the cardinality to some specific value. So in that sense, the indicator is not very informative. Whatever information is given is not very reliable. So reporting the ratio of the Pareto front approximation cardinality to the discretized true Pareto front give us just some feeling for the number of non-dominated vectors uh, that we have found with respect to how many we expect to find. But that's about it. It is a reference measure. It uses the true Pareto front as a reference. It induces a complete ordering, and it is a cardinal measure. It's not weakly compatible, so it's not reliable. It doesn't exhibit weak monotony or weak relativity. The advantage is very easy to compute, and it's scaling independent. The disadvantage is that we require the true Pareto front. Discretize, of course, so that we can have a fixed number of solutions. It's not compatible with any outperformance relation, and is a uh, it's kind of useful in the pathological case when the whole search space is the Pareto front, but other than in that case, it's difficult to, to think of a situation in which it can be useful. Generational non-dominated vector generation. This indicator tracks how many non-dominated vectors are produced at this generation, and is defined like this. It's, it's just the cardinality of what Beldoysen calls the current Pareto front approximation. T is the generation. So as normally we look for global non-dominated vectors, one hopes to have 
more non-dominant solutions at, at this generation. So they define also the non-dominated vector addition that if you see is just the difference between the solutions, the number of non-dominant solutions that I found at generation t minus the number of solutions I found at generation t minus 1. I always expect this to increase. This doesn't always happen. You actually could decrease the number of non-dominant solutions. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your algorithm is doing very badly. It depends on the, on the selection mechanism you, you have. But all these indicators were proposed in the 90s. So this second indicator may be misleading because if we add a single vector to, to our approximation that dominates many solutions, then this, only, this single solution will remove many solutions, so the cardinality is going gonna, is gonna to decrease. Also, it could happen that the cardinality remains the same for several generations, but that doesn't mean we are doing bad because solutions are different. It's, it's just the total number is the same. So these two indicators are not Pareto compatible. They do not exhibit weak relativity or weak monotony. The spacing, this is an interesting <laughs> indicator. This indicator was uh, proposed by this guy, Schott, in a master's thesis from MIT. The master's thesis has nothing to do with evolutionary computation because computer science people at MIT, they don't like metaheuristics. So this was done by an engineer. It was a guy who was, I think, in mechanical engineering. And in 95, he wrote his master's thesis on the design of submarines. And, uh, and he had used some algorithms like MPGA. I think he used MOGA, the original NSGA, on this design problem. But he needed performance indicators to, to assess performance. So he looked in the literature, didn't find any for diversity. So he, he proposed one which many people has used. This SS is, a, is called efficient spacing. And it's a very simple indicator. If you see, it's only measuring the uh, distance between consecutive solutions in the Pareto form. It's based on Holder's metric of degree one that is discussed by, by Horn in, uh, in his uh, technical report where he proposes MPGA. This is the master's thesis. I, I have it. It's a bit difficult to obtain, but uh, I have it from, from MIT. He was in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And, and it's very interesting. The, this performance measure, of course, has some issues, but it has been used a lot. A lot of people use this, this measure. This measure is not for convergence. It's for uniform distribution of solutions. So we don't require, of course, the true Pareto front, because we assume we are already in the true Pareto front. Uh, it's independent. It induces a complete ordering, and it's cardinal. It's, of course, not compatible with OW. Uh, it doesn't have monotony or relativity, but that's OK, because this is not a convergence measure. So not having these properties is fine. If you use this combined with other indicators, it provides information about the distribution of the solution that we obtain. It has a low computational overhead. It can be generalized to more than two objectives, which is good. Some disadvantages, well, it doesn't specify the use of normalized distances, which may be, of course, a, a problem. Uh, it, of course, it's incompatible, which means it's unreliable. But it's unreliable only for convergence. We are not using this for convergence. And it has to be adapted. The, the main disadvantage, I think, is this, that what happens if the true Pareto front is disconnected? Because if you saw the definition, it's measuring consecutive distances. So I, I have a Pareto front. And it's measuring the distance from this to this, from this to this, from this to this, and so on. So what happens if I have a hole in the Pareto front? When I measure this distance, it's going to be a very large value. So the, the indicator is going to penalize this value. So this is, of course, bad. So you have to do some tricks to, to avoid these situations, or simply live with this, because every algorithm will have the same, the same uh, penalty. So it's not much of an issue either. But uh, 
That's really the main problem of this, of this indicator. Uh, I think I repeated the same. Yeah, depth spacing. In the paper of the NSGA2, published in a journal in 2002, uh, Deb introduces another uh, indicator very similar to uh, Chot's spacing. It's also called spacing, which is very confusing, <laughs> but this is depth spacing. It's called delta in the paper. And if you see, again measures the distance between two consecutive vectors, but here D, uh, D slash is, is the average of these distances. So it's computing the distance minus the average. And again, the idea is to assess if you produce a uniform distribution of solutions in the, in the Pareto form. So it's independent, it, in, it induces a complete ordering, it's a non-cardinal measure, it's not weakly compatible, and it doesn't exhibit a weak monotony or weak relativity. Uh, of course, it could happen that the true Pareto form has a non-uniform distribution. That means every approximation is going to be penalized. Because if you are trying to approximate something that is non-uniform, it doesn't make any sense that you try to get a uniform approximation. But that's what the indicator tries to get. It's meant to be used with other indicators to give you some information about the distribution of solutions at a low uh, computational uh, cost. So it's only suitable for two-dimensional objective space because it's not clear how would you define consecutive if you have more than two dimensions. You have five dimensions, for example. What do you mean by consecutive? Do you mean in every dimension we should move? So it's not that obvious. Uh, it has some normalization and scaling issues as with any other indicator that, that combines uh, objectives. And it's also incompatible, which, as I said, is not a big deal because it's not a, a convergence indicator. This is an interesting one, but this is a binary indicator. All the others we, we, we describe are unary indicators. This one, however, is, is, uh, is binary. Why do you think it's binary? On what, what does binary mean in this uh, context? Anybody? Any guy at the back can tell me? What will be the difference between a unary and a binary indicator? No. It's not related to the body. But it's a good case. <laughs> Any other guess? Of what would be the difference between unary and binary? Yeah. But who? Who is that? <laughs> yeah, it means one, but who is that? Remember, the, the performance indicator is applied on the output of an average. So what do you think it means when we say unary? And what's the difference when we say it's binary? The indicator is applied to the, to the output. Right? We, I know you miss all the definitions. You are looking at your phone and checking your email. It's fine. Don't worry. It happens to me all the time. But we talk about the definitions of A and B. Right? Those are the approximations. So I'm trying to compare the outcome of algorithm A with the outcome of algorithm B. All the indicators I already covered up to this point are unary because they are applied only to the outcome of one algorithm. One means the algorithm. Okay? This one is binary because at the same time, I will apply this indicator to the outcome of two algorithms, A and B, at the same time, not separately. The others, first I apply it to A, then I apply it to B, and I compare. This gives me uh, two, this gives me one, one is better than two, then this wins. <coughs> but this one at the same time will tell me, putting the two, which one is better. Or will try to tell me, because it has some problems. So the relative uh, coverage comparison of two sets was proposed by Sitzler, and it's a very interesting uh, indicator. Basically, what he does is he combines the solutions produced by two algorithms, and he checks dominance. So I have 
for example, this approximation from one algorithm, and then the other, I'm going to use crosses, the other algorithm produces something like this. So, first, it's going to check how many solutions from algorithm A dominate solutions produced by algorithm B. Do you remember if Pareto dominance is reflexive? It is not reflexive, right? So I have to measure this also all the other way around. I have to check how many solutions from B dominate A. So you have to do it in the two directions because this is not necessarily the case. And the indicator will give me a value normalized to 1, which is the percentage of solutions from A that dominate B and the percentage of solutions from B that dominate A. The ideal is that when I apply the indicator from A to B, tells me this is 1. And when I do it from B to A, it tells me this is 0. Because this means all the solutions from A dominate solutions from B. And no solution from B dominates a solution from A. If this happens, this is paradise. You know? Your algorithm is awesome. Bad news is this normally never happens. Unless, of course, you compare with some really crappy algorithm. You choose Vega or something like that, then you will, you will find this. But with any recent algorithm, this will never happen. So the result is very difficult to interpret. Because you will have something like, this is 0.52, and then this is 0.43. So it looks like a tie, right? Like about half of the points I dominate, but almost I'm dominated in almost half of the points. So I'm a little bit better, but not that much better. And sometimes it's worse. It will look very similar in the two directions. So that means, you know, I'm not better than the other guy. We have about the same performance. So it's, it's difficult to interpret unless you clearly win. Any other value is, is difficult. Unless, of course, this value is very close to 1, and this is very close to 0. That is also possible, right? You get 0.85 and 0.15, then clearly you won. But in other cases, it's, it's difficult. But it's a nice indicator. So the idea is to compare two non-dominated sets for uh, overall quality. It's a direct comparison. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, to establish if this indicator induces a complete ordering, because it's not clear how should we interpret this, this comparison. So this, this part of the analysis is not available. Uh, Pareto compatibility, since gives two values when compare sets A and B, it's more difficult to analyze if it's compatible with the outperformance uh, relations. It depends on how we interpret the, the indicator. So, but in general, it's, a, it's considered a good, a good indicator. However, this indicator also has a pathological case. Uh, well, at least one. Perhaps there are more. Uh, some years ago, when we work with epsilon dominance, and we talk about epsilon dominance, Yesterday, we had sometimes some funny situations. We had algorithm A that produced, using epsilon dominance, a very nice approximation of the Pareto front, something like this. But it was missing the extreme points. If you remember yesterday, I mentioned that when you use epsilon dominance, you can never obtain the extreme points of the Pareto front. So sometimes the other algorithm we use to compare results only produce the extreme points and nothing in between. If you apply this, the coverage of two sets, it will tell you there is a tie. <laughs> because these points are not dominated by this. And these points don't dominate these two, right? They are non-dominated. So in terms of dominance, there is a tie. 
But if you plot the Pareto form, it doesn't make any sense. You say, well, clearly this algorithm is better than the other. But you are only saying dominance, right? So dominance says this is a tie. So it can be also bias. It's just, it's not so obvious to see the bias. Yes. No, Pareto. Yeah, yeah, but the weak dominance in here refers to the fact that to facilitate the comparison, you, you normally implement this with weak dominance. But the idea is to use Pareto, strictly Pareto, which is the case of the example. It's not going to make any difference in this case. In this example does in the implementation, it's easier to use weak dominance. It's more efficient. And in the definition of the indicator, it's also a idea. But the original idea is, is that you compare directly with one dominance. So it should be weak dominance is better than the strictly dominance and strong. No, no, it, it's not better. It, it's just that weak dominance is, what, is sufficient for you to, to say that the result is reliable. A strong dominance is, is too restrictive, even the Pareto dominance is too restrictive. It's not possible theoretically to, to claim that the algorithm has a problem. The one that you can claim is weak. And it's easier to check because it's just less lesson. OK. So this indicator cannot detect situations uh, in which uh, we have, for example, a comparison <coughs> with, a no, with a, the outcome of another uh, set uh, in which, like, like in this situation, there is a tie. When there is a tie, the indicator doesn't give much information about what's happening because it's not a cardinality measure. If I had a cardinality measure, then I could know that one approximation has more solutions than the other one. But in here, it's only measured in terms of percentage, of how many solutions in, in percentage are dominating uh, the solutions of the other one. So this is, of course, a, a problem in some cases. This is, of course, a pathological case. It's not very common to have this. But uh, it, it's, it's an indicator that was used for some years. Still, some people use it. Uh, it's particularly good in situations in which you don't know the true Pareto optimal front. When you don't know the Pareto optimal front, this is a good measure to compare directly with respect to another algorithm. Because then, even if none of the algorithms reach the true Pareto optimal front, same as with the hypervolume, you have a, a numerical value that can tell you if you are producing better solutions than the other one. That means your approximation is better. You don't know if this approximation is the true Pareto optimal front. You only know it's better than the other one. So in that sense, it's, it's good. But many people don't like it because it's a, it's a little bit cumbersome to do this in the two directions. The tables are difficult to read. You need to have some practice to interpret these tables. At the beginning, they don't make any, any sense. So it has, a, it has some limitations. Also, it's worth noticing that this indicator doesn't give an output which is representative of our intuitions about the relative quality of two sets, unless the two sets contain very evenly distributed points and are of the very, very similar cardinality. This is another important point. If you are comparing directly two, two approximations, it will be unfair if one approximation has, for example, only 10 solutions and the other approximation has 1,000. The underlying assumption is the two approximations have pretty much the same number of points. Because if not, very strange things could happen. Like you have only one point, and it's very good. It's non-dominant. Like this case, it's non-dominant. But it's not fair, right? Because the other points are also non-dominant. They, they have a good distribution. But in terms of dominance, they are not better than the only point you have. So the assumption is the canality should be the same. You should not apply when the canality is not the same. It's just that this is something you cannot control. If you are using somebody else's algorithm, and this algorithm produces only one or two points, what can you do? Right? It's not your fault. It's just the algorithm is very bad. So 
But if you can avoid this, you should, because carnality is, is important. So advantages, it has a, a low computational overhead compared to hypervolume. It's compatible with OS. It's a scale and reference point independent. Doesn't require knowledge about the, uh, the Pareto optimal set. And, and for two evenly distributed sets of the same cardinality gives results that are uh, sort of intuitive and, and are reliable. It's not compatible with OW, which in this case is not that bad because it's, it's, although it's a convergence uh, indicator, we are not using the true Pareto optimal front. Now, problems. If two sets are of different cardinality and or the distributions of these sets is non-uniform, then it's unreliable. It cannot give uh, the degree of outperformance in, if one set completely outperforms the other. This is also another, another problem. So uh, it probably would be better to use a variation of this indicator or, or just doing a, a direct checking of solutions or combining the outcome of this indicator with another one. Oh, the <laughs> no, no, it's not sufficient. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Uh, normally, uh, well, in the technical report I put from Joshua Knowles, they give some recommendations on how to use this indicator. What you have to do is to perform several independent runs. The minimum is 10, but most people do 30. And for each run, the final outcome, you have to apply the indicator in the two directions. Then you, you put this table with the outcome of each run, and you do the statistics on, this, on these values. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Normally, we, we do uh, the uh, Wilcoxon. Wilcoxon test is the, is the one that most people do. Yeah, yeah, that's Wilcoxon. Wilcoxon for... Uh, Multi-objective version is Will Cox on the, uh, the, 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 the TS student test. It's the same, yeah. So, yeah, it's true. That's a good point that I was missing. In this case, it's tricky to do the, uh, the analysis. In all the others, it's very easy because you have a single value. So this single value, you just do several runs and, and do your statistics on the several runs. But in this case, you have twice the number of values. And to be fair, you are supposed to do the runs uh, for the uh, for the for each run, you have to use the same random seed to compute in the two directions the indicator, because then otherwise you could have uh, some different results. So there are some rules on how to do this. Yeah, that's a, a good point that I was missing. The next indicator is the R indicator, it was proposed by Sysag and, and Jaskiewicz in '98, and and is defined. This way is not a very complicated definition. Uh, it, it's actually a family of indicators. It's not one. A is the approximation set. R is a reference set. And, uh, and D is defined as, as the maximum of these values. These lambdas are weights that you have to define. So you, you need a scalarizing function, we call it. So, this indicator aims to measure the mean distance over the points in a reference set of the nearest point in an approximation set. It's a reference indicator that induces a complete ordering and is a non-cardinal uh, measure. It's weakly compatible with OW, which is good. However, it's not compatible with OC or OS. It's cheap to compute. Uh, one advantage is that it's weakly compatible with the outperformance relations. It can differentiate between different levels of complete outperformance, but this depends on the reference set. These advantages, it, it, it calculates a weighted average where the reference points have equal weight, but this means that the, the values you obtain strongly depend upon the distribution of points in the reference set. So this is a limitation. Uh, then we have that was D1. This is R1 and R1R, uh, also proposed by uh, Jaskiewicz, but this time with Hansen. 
R1 is defined this way. In here, A and B are two approximation sets. U is some utility function or set of utility functions. And the idea in this case is uh, to calculate the probability that approximation A is better than B over a, a whole set of utility functions. So in that regard, it's a direct comparative indicator. It doesn't induce a total ordering, uh, and it is a non-cardinal uh, measure. So R1R is, uh, is R1 when, it, when we use it with a reference set. And in that case, it doesn't induce a total ordering on, on the set of approximations. So uh, the Pareto compatibility, if we are maximizing all the objectives, then a utility function will be strictly compatible with the dominance relation under certain conditions. And, and in that case, of course, it will have compatibility with OW, which is a good thing. Um, so it's a scaling independent. It has a lower computational overhead than the hypervolume. It's a compatible with the outperformance relations. And if we use the reference set, we can differentiate between different levels of complete outperformance, which is also very good. One uh, uh, disadvantage is R1 cannot differentiate between different levels of complete outperformance. It is cycle in inducing. And it depends on being able to define a set of utility functions, which this is not really that difficult to do. But uh, it's nevertheless a disadvantage. R1 is not very used, but R2 is, is relatively popular these days. At least we have used this a lot. It's a variation of the previous indicator. Again, we have A and B are two approximation sets. U is a set of utility functions. But instead of using uh, this function C of ABU to decide which uh, of the two approximations is better on a utility function U, R2 takes into account the expected values of the utility. So it, it computes the expected difference in the utility of an approximation A with respect to, to another approximation B. So it's, again, a direct comparative indicator. And it's also uh, uh, an indicator to assess per, uh, convergence. So R2 induces a complete ranking in the set of all approximations. It's a non-cardinal measure. And again, there is a variation called R2R, in which we use uh, a reference. It's compatible with OW, which is good, subject to the uh, same set of conditions defined for R1. But uh, the main advantage is for many people, R2 has better mathematical properties than R1. I mentioned yesterday that R2 has a weak monotony, not a strict monotony as the hypervolume, but this is as good as we can get if we, if we don't want to spend a lot of time computing the, uh, the indicator. So it's a very nice performance indicator. Uh, the application of the indicator depends upon the assumption that it is meaningful to add the values of different utility functions from, from the set that we have available. So this means that each utility function in U must be scaled with respect to the others, and it's relatively important, which, as I said, is not difficult to do. There is also R3. R3 is not very common. Uh, in this case, the ratio of the best utility values is, is calculated instead of the differences. Uh, again, R3R uses a, a reference. Uh, and it's similar to uh, an indicator used for single objective optimization when the approximate solution is evaluated by the ratio of its value to that of a fixed bound. So it's, it's just another. A uh, small modification. R2 and R1 are normally not used. R2 has been used a lot. There are many other indicators, for example, epsilon, distributed spacing, progress measure, attainment functions, size of the space covered. So I will try to explain a little bit of these indicators. But uh, before, I would like to stop for, for a couple of minutes just to see if, if, if you are uh, getting something of this or you are just completely lost at this point on performance indicators. 
We have seen most of them unary. The only binary we saw is a coverage of two sets, and the R indicators, R1, R2, R3, are all binary indicators. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we do use the statistics. No, what I say is in the unary, you only have one value per run. So you just do 30 runs, and you get the statistics on the 30 values. It's exactly the same. In binary, it's more complicated, because you have to do the statistics for each run for each of the two algorithms. Right? So you have to do a table, and then compute the statistics on this table. It's not completely straightforward, because you have to do it one to one. The outcome of algorithm A in wrong one, if you measure C from A to B, is this. If you measure C from B to A, is this. And now let's do it for the other algorithm. So you, you have to do this for every algorithm and every pair, every combination. If you are comparing, for example, four algorithms, is one with two, one with three, one with four. And it's all the combinations you have to do. That's what I'm saying. So the statistics is, takes a lot of time. If it's unary, it's very simple because it's only one value. So you just do the statistics on the 30 values. <laughs> it's straightforward. But that's why people don't like binary indicators. Mm -hmm. The binary has that disadvantage. Yes. No. No, because then it will not be the true Pareto optimal flow, right? It's like if you ask me, is it possible to improve the optimum? Well, what's the definition of optimum? <laughs> the optimum is the best you can get, right? If you can get something better, then it's not the optimum. It's the same here. You cannot improve the optimum. It could happen that if you don't know the true Pareto flow and you are using a reference, then your algorithm improves the reference. But that is because it's not the true Pareto flow. But if you have the true Pareto front, there is no way you can do better than that, unless you did something wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's possible with evolutionary algorithms. Everything is possible. I think I told you yesterday that the, the initial version of NSGA2 had an error in the crossover operator. So it generated a solution beyond the boundaries. And therefore, you could find a better Pareto front. <laughs> so it's, it's, of course, something impossible, unless there is something wrong in your, in your code. Uh-huh. Normally, when, when you write a paper, uh, particularly if you are designing a new multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, it is advisable that you use two indicators for convergence and one for uh, uniform distribution. It can be one and one, but the most common is to do two. Because normally, we don't trust only one. So these two of convergence, many people use, for example, IGD and perhaps hyperbolic. And in here, many people use spacing. That's the most common thing to do. Unless, of course, it's a, it's a problem with very uh, specific uh, characteristics. For example, if it's a, a, a real-world problem in which you don't know the, uh, the true Pareto optimal front and it's very expensive to evaluate the objective function, then perhaps you won't be able to collect statistics because a single run may take several days. So you're not going to ask the authors, give me 50 executions of your algorithm to, to see if the results are statistically confident. In those cases, even the use of performance indicators is, is not required. But if you write a paper and you want to publish this paper in a specialized conference, a specialized journal, they will ask you this. If you don't have this, the paper is going to be rejected. Performance indicators are important. And don't use the old ones, like GD, error rate. If you put those indicators, that's the end of it. It's an easy reject. You don't even have to read the paper. Because the results, of course, are not reliable. And some indicators, like hypervolume, as I mentioned yesterday, 
there are several places where you can download code to compute it. And my advice is, if you want to use indicators like the hypervolume, get those implementations. Don't try to implement the uh, hypervolume yourself unless you really know what you're doing. Because it's, it's complicated and it's very easy to make mistakes. Very, very easy. It's, it's a lot easier to, to do it wrong than to do it right. So it's better to get the code that some other people developed that is already well tested. Some years ago, in, uh, in PISA, PISA was a software platform. We, we talked about that yesterday. It's available in the EMO repository, a link to PISA. I believe it's still there. PISA had the code of several performance indicators that you could use, uh, including some of Beldoisen's indicators, hypervolume, and, and, and some others. So there are some places where you can download this code if you don't want to implement the, uh, the indicators. Also, some software platforms have, have code available. But this is uh, highly advisable if you intend to publish in a specialized conference or journal. And by specialized, I mean evolutionary computation conference or journal. OK, there are no further questions. Then we're going to explain quickly this, these other five indicators. The epsilon indicator, I already explained. Given two approximations, A and B, measures the smallest amount epsilon that we have to translate the set A so that every point in B is covered. It's weakly Pareto compliant. No, that means it's good. It's a good indicator. Not very common. It's, it's not uh, commonly used today. For some reason, some people don't like it, probably because it's binary. People don't like binary indicators. This is the formal definition. Distributed spacing. This is a very strange indicator. It was proposed in the original NSGA paper. And after that, everybody forgot about this indicator, including Kalja Moidev, who is the guy who proposed the indicator. For some reason, even he didn't like it. And, and this was proposed because at that time, we didn't have indicators for uh, uniform distribution. So it sort of made sense. The indicator is actually not that complicated. What they did is to assume that when you have your distribution of points, you can match these points with the true Pareto optimal front using a chi square distribution. So with this distribution, you try to find the closest point to, uh, to the one that you want to achieve. So if you have, this is the true Pareto optimal front, and you produce something like this with your algorithm, then you will try to match how close is each point in your approximation to the point in the reference set, which is the true Pareto front. So that's exactly what they tried to do with this, with this expression. It, it, it looks complicated, cumbersome, but it's not really that, that complicated. But uh, eventually, people uh, develop other, other measures. So again, this measure is meant to be zero. The ideal value is, is zero. And any low value is supposed to be, to be good. Progress measure was a, it's a variation of uh, a performance indicator proposed by Thomas Beck. Thomas Beck proposed this. Here is f max is the best objective function value at generation i. So if you see in here, it's computing the best value at the beginning of the search with respect to the best value at the end of the search. Uh, capital T is the last generation. So how much did we improve the objective function? But this is in single objective. In multi-objective, Beldoisin proposed to use generational distance. So what is the value, the best value of the generational distance at generation one with respect to the value at generation T? So how much improvement were we able to, to achieve. Attainment functions, this was used by Fonseca. It was proposed by Fonseca in 96. But very few people have used this uh, indicator because also it's a, it's a bit complicated. Uh, what is an attainment surface? OK. If we have a set of non-dominated points in objective space, this set defines a region that is dominated by them, similar to the idea of the hyperbola. 
So the boundary of this region is a surface that Fonseca calls the attainment surface. So if we measure the location and extent of this surface, we can judge how good the approximation to the true Pareto front is. And, and this is the intuition behind the, uh, the indicator. The problem with this indicator is that it's a little bit complicated to implement it. In the original paper, there is no algorithm to compute it, only like a, a graph giving the intuition behind it. This is the original paper from 96. And Joshua Knowles implemented a version in the year 2000, a version that Fonseca didn't like. And, and some people have used Joshua's implementation, which I believe is, is a nice one. But uh, the real one, only Fonseca knows, because it's ha it hasn't been released in the public domain. So in the paper of 96, they, they indicate that when several rounds of an optimizer are, are performed, it's possible to overlay the attainment surface for an each independent run. And, and this will give a, a, a clear picture of the different runs. So the idea, let me see if I can explain this graphically, the idea of the indicator is that when you have one approximation, I have, for example, this point. In this case, I don't know what is the true Pareto front. So what he does, he, he draws lines. And then he has like steps. And this is a sort of a, a piecewise linear approximation you can produce an approximation of where the Pareto front was for this particular execution of, of the algorithm. And this gives you a numerical value. Then he, what he was trying to do is very similar to the idea of the hypervolume. But in here, his reference is not here. His reference is here. It's in the origin. So he computes this towards this axis. Then you do it again. You do the statistics. Eventually, of course, if you assume you are minimizing this value, as you decrease this value, you are getting closer to this axis, so the approximation should be better. So you do several executions, get the statistics on that, and you can give a number that gives you an absolute value of the quality of your approximation. That's really the idea of the attainment surface. So you give this, and, and, and you tell the, uh, the decision maker, this is how my algorithm is performing. The problem with this first is it's not very clear, at least not in the paper, of how to compute this, this surface. He gives some hints, no pseudocode, no algorithm, no equation. So, you know, just words, many words in the paper. So it's not entirely clear how you are supposed to, to do this. And, uh, and also the other problem is how are you going to, uh, compute the whole value. In the hypervolume, it's clear because you are adding these boxes, so you have a volume. But in here, it's not a volume. It's supposed to be a surface. So how do you compute this surface? This is not clear also. So it's a, it's a nice idea, but uh, not, not easy to, to implement. Even in the paper of 96, they indicate some weaknesses of the approach. For example, one is that the calculated percentile attainment surfaces do not represent properly the probability of attaining the whole surface. So getting one good point, what point that is in the true Pareto front, doesn't necessarily mean that you will eventually obtain all the points that are in the Pareto front, which is true. But uh, they don't give an option also of how to, how to fix this. Uh, also, they don't say how this approach could be used with reference surfaces. For example, what if I already know the true Pareto optimal front? Can I compute the attainment surface of this optimal uh, approximation or the true Pareto front and compare that with my own approximation? This they don't, they don't say. 
And, and this exactly is, is what Joshua proposed in 2002, to, to use an approximation. Size of the space covered is another indicator forgotten by the world, proposed by Sitzler, estimates the size of the global dominated set in objective function space. The idea here is to compute the area of objective function space covered by the non-dominated vectors generated by, by an algorithm. So for example, if I have two objective functions, and each non-dominated vector represents a rectangle that goes from 0, 0 to F1, Xi, and F2, Xi, this will be a, this area that I'm talking about, the area of this rectangle. So SSC is calculated as the union of the areas of all the rectangles that correspond to the non-dominated vectors that have been generated. However, if the Pareto frame is non-convex, it can produce errors. This indicator, I believe, was like a, a, an initial attempt to design the hypervolume. He, he was trying to do something like the hypervolume, didn't know how. He came out first with this idea. And normally, it's, it's hard to, uh, to get a good idea since the very beginning. Laumanns used this concept to compare problems with more than two objectives using an m-dimensional cuboid as the reference set. But uh, this was a technical report, was never published. This is at the time when Marco was an undergraduate student at the University of Dortmund. You can see his, uh, his advisor was Hans Paul uh, Schwiffel. And Gunther, is, uh, Gunther took the seat of Hans Paul Schwiffel, the only uh, seat in Germany for uh, full professor in, in evolutionary computation was the seat that Hans Paul Schwefel uh, occupied for several years. He retired some years ago, and, and this uh, seat was inherited to, uh, to Gunther. Gunther worked some years in industry and then went back to, uh, to Dortmund. In, in Germany, they have an interesting system because in the whole country, there is a fixed number of positions for full professor. It doesn't grow, <laughs> it's fixed. So the only way you can get one of those positions is that the guy retires or dies. No? Or you can kill him if you want, but otherwise you're not gonna get the position. <laughs> they don't increase the number of positions. And, and in computer science, they didn't wanna have any positions in evolutionary computation, but since Hans Paul was such a famous guy, he, uh, he is the inventor of evolution strategies. Eventually, Dortmund decided to, to create this, uh, this position for him, but with the condition that they will have no other position in the same area. Uh, in the same university, they have Ingo Rehenberg. In, Ingo Rehenberg is the other pioneer, the, other, the co inventor of evolution strategy. He's actually a very interesting guy. He's now probably 80, he's, he's very old but he's still active. He doesn't do evolutionary computation anymore. He works in bionics, but uh, he, he has been designing like uh, green structures, and other structures imitating insects. So he takes these long trips to uh, jungles, uh, <coughs> deserts, trying to find new insects he can use to, uh, to design these uh, these biological or bionic structures. And, and it's such a lucky guy that they told me a couple of years ago, he went into the desert in Africa, I don't know where, and he discovered a new species of a spider. So this spider has now his name because he's the one who discovered it. This is a really lucky guy, <laughs> Ingo Rehenberg. So each uh, non-dominant solution with this, um, indicator provides a cone of dominant solutions. And the intersection of the cone with the reference cuboid, this cuboid that Laumanns defined, is aggregated to the dominated volume. So when computing the dominated volume, we avoid counting several times the overlaps. So it's, it's kind of a nice idea, but it has some problems. The reference cuboid is developed using the optimum solutions considering each of the objectives uh, separately. This means that we must know a priori the, the solutions and, and, or they should be easy to generate. In real world problems, of course, uh, this could not be possible. We could not do this, this sort of thing. 
Now, the value of the space cover varies with the number of non-dominant solutions. So this is a problem of this indicator. And, and this is perhaps the only indicator that has ever been proposed in which they attempt to combine convergence, a spread, a number of Pareto optimal elements, the three things in one single indicator. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't work very nicely, because if you combine the three things, many uh, possible situations can occur that introduce bias. There are, of course, many other indicators. This is not a very active area of research. Not that many people propose indicators, because performance indicators are on the uh, on the dark side of the moon, right? They, they, they are uh, these abstract mathematical entities. You have to prove things about them. So you need to be either a mathematician or, or a physicist, somebody who knows what he's doing, because otherwise they are going to eat you alive when, when you try to publish this. Because the reviewers will be mathematicians or physicists, and, and they will know that it's wrong, whatever you are saying. So it, it's, a, it's a very narrow area of research. But from time to time, some people make uh, new proposals. For example, this guy, Farhan Mer. Farhan Mer was a guy, very interesting guy. His undergrad degree was in physics. And for some reason, he decided to become an engineer. So he went into a PhD in mechanical engineering. And, and he was doing multi-objective optimization. And he proposed in his PhD thesis a new performance indicator based on entropy. It's actually a very interesting indicator, but I saw his presentation uh, uh, some years ago when, when he presented this in a conference and, and people wanted to, to kill him. But it, it was a, yeah, it was, the presentation didn't go very well. But the indicator was, was very interesting. What he was doing was to project points always in a, in a two-dimensional surface, uh, regardless of how many objectives you had, which was the main criticism. Other than that, in low dimensionality, the indicator was, was nice. Uh, so what he does is he uses entropy as an index. And with this, he can assess the distribution. This is an indicator not for convergence, but for distribution of solutions. It's a nice idea. But S energy is better than this one, the, the one we saw yesterday. You already forgot about that one. But one day, you will digest all these slides. So, uh, this index can be used to capture and compare capability of uh, generating well-distributed solutions. So it's, it's, it's really a, 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 an indicator for uniform distribution, not for convergence. Uh, these guys, these are guys from Mexico. This is also very interesting, very interesting story. In 2003, Sisler, Fonseca, and, and other people published a very important paper in which they analyzed performance indicators. And, and in this analysis of performance indicators, it's a theoretical analysis, they concluded that no unary indicator was reliable, except for the hyperbola. That was a very strong result. They said, you know, none of the unary indicators that we have, except for the hyperbola, are to be trusted, because they are not Pareto compliant. Well, this guy, Giovanni, who, who was a, a master's student at CIMAT. CIMAT is a center for research in mathematics in Guanajuato, in central Mexico. He was able to find an error in the proof. And, and he was able to prove that Sisler's proof was wrong. However, they didn't want to publish that paper at Gecko because they said it was irrelevant. Of course, it was not irrelevant. It's just probably, I don't know, the reviewer was a friend of Sisler, didn't like this. But uh, what they were able to prove was not that Sisler was wrong in his, uh, in his conclusion, in the main result. They were able to prove that with the axioms he had, you could not conclude that the unary indicators are not reliable. That's what they were able to prove, which is very interesting. And he proposed a weird metric called the G metric, you know, ego. G is for Giovanni, is his name. The G metric, which takes n non-dominated sets as an argument and assigns a real number to each of them based on conversion and, and what he calls dispersion extension. It is compatible with all the outperformance relations, but it's kind of a nasty, complicated indicator that, of course, nobody uses. 
Uh, and uh, it's there. It was published in a decent conference in Gecko, but nobody really liked this, this indicator. This is the paper I mentioned, uh, published by Sitzler in 2003 in the Transactions on Evolutionary Computation. It, the, the key result is that the hypervolume is the only unary indicator that fulfills this property of Pareto uh, uh, compliance. And the most astonishing result is that they are able that even the combination of unary indicators does not allow to derive solid conclusions about our, our results. That means we cannot claim algorithm A is better than algorithm B, not only using one unary indicator, any combination of them still is unreliable. And this they prove in the paper. So this result is the one that was refuted by, by Giovanni. But this is the paper I told you was not uh, accepted at, at Gecko. And they published this in some obscure uh, Mexican conference. But uh, the paper is in English. Uh, this is very interesting. And, and, and it seems to be the case that, that he's right, that Giovanni is right. Uh, I also mentioned this tutorial. This is a nice tutorial if you want to learn more about how to, uh, how to present results using performance indicators. This is highly recommended. It's available in the IMO repository. Uh, it, it, this is a tutorial we had at IMO 2005. I was the general chair of IMO 2005 in Guanajuato. It was updated in 2006. They, they made a few changes. Uh, it's, uh, it's highly recommended because they show, particularly for binary performance measures, how to use them. They talk about non-parametric analysis, which is what we normally use. Why do we use non-parametric analysis to validate our results? Because normally, the uh, performing just a few runs, 20, 30 independent runs, is not enough, and these results do not follow a normal distribution. So. It's better to use non-parametric analysis because in that case, it's not necessary we follow a normal distribution. Whatever results we have, we will be able to analyze. What we normally use is Wilcoxon sign rank test, which is the uh, multi-objective version of the T-student, uh, to report a statistical significance. It's very important today in papers to have this because if you don't have a statistical analysis of results and you submit this to a specialized conference or journal, you are going to get your paper rejected. Because reviewers will look into this first. Unless it's, it's another sort of paper, like a philosophical paper, or you are proposing a performance indicator, you are performing, proposing a test problem, something else. But if you are uh, validating algorithms, then you have to do all this. And all other further readings on, on this topic, uh, if you want to know more, there are several interesting papers. Some of these I had already shown. Um, this is an interesting paper, Consistencies and Contradictions of, of Performance mesh Metrics. Uh, actually, it's, it's incorrect, call them metrics. They are not metrics because they don't fulfill the mathematical definition of metric. So the correct term is performance measures, not metrics. But yeah, you can call them anything you want. Nobody really cares. Um, this is an interesting paper. It was also published in, a, in an obscure Latin American conference. But it's the most comprehensive review I have seen of performance measures. It has a massive table with some performance measures I didn't even know that existed. Some really weird, me I don't know how they found this. These guys are from Paraguay. It's a very interesting paper. So that's all I have on performance indicators. I don't know if you have any questions. Oh, we analyze already each of them. <laughs> we already analyze each of them. If they have O W, they are transparent. If they don't have O W, they are not. You missed the beginning, right? Eh? You fell asleep at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning, I mentioned that. You're not the only one. I also own the <laughs> <laughs> But 
my case is okay. I have 10, 10 and a half hours different. It's okay if I pause. Yeah. In the old days, as, as I mentioned before, we didn't have any performance measure. We didn't have any numerical quantity we, we could use. So as I, uh, as I indicated in, in the morning, we rely on direct comparisons, and, and we sort of commented on that. And all the performance indicators were proposed basically from the mid-90s to perhaps the year 2006, 2007. More recently, there have been a few, but very few. Most of them were proposed around the mid-90s and beginning of the 2000s. However, most of them are not Pareto compliant. We already saw that. That means they are not compatible with the, def with the definition of Pareto optimality, which means they are not reliable. In the early days, most of the performance indicators were unary. That means they assess the outcome of a single algorithm. But over the years, some binary indicators were proposed. But people in this area, for some reason, they don't like binary performance indicators. If you use them, nobody will complain. That's a, a good thing. Reviewers are never going to complain if you use a binary performance indicator. But most people are reluctant to use them because of these complexities that I mentioned and, and this uh, crazy idea that people have now that for you to produce a new paper, you have to do hundreds of comparisons. You have to use 50 test problems, 10 algorithms, you know, lots of comparisons. So if you do that, don't go for a binary indicator because you're going to need like 50 pages for all your tables. So this is impossible, right? So you will have to put it somewhere else. Uh, the other problem we have now, uh, at least in the, in the top journals, for example, the IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation, they, they have a sort of a crisis that has been accumulating for several years because they have uh, many papers that have been accepted and are not yet published because they don't have a sufficient number of pages to publish them. Because they get a budget of pages for year. It's, I don't know, a thousand pages or something. But it's, it's not enough. So this thing is called by, by publishers the backlog. Well, the backlog of the transactions is about one year. So that means that if you submit your paper, the first round of review will take about two months. Then they will give you 45 days, between 30 and 45 days, to submit a revision. You submit the revision. If you are lucky and in the revision, your paper gets accepted. It will be after another two months. So that's four months plus one month in writing the revision. Then they will ask you the final version. We'll give you like two weeks for that. So that's about six months. Once accepted, it will take at least one year for your paper to be published. Because it will go to the queue. And there are many other papers in the queue waiting to be, to be published. So this is, of course, a problem. Because in evolutionary computation, this discipline changes very quickly. So it may happen that by the time your paper gets published, it's already obsolete. Which is OK, right? Because nobody was going to read it anyway. But in case they read it, it's probably of no use. You're not going to get citations as you expect because it's a highly uh, cited journal. It has a very high impact factor. So it's a problem. So what they have done in the last three years is they have been systematically reducing the number of pages of papers that get published in the transactions. At the beginning, there was no limit. Then they set the limit in 13 pages, two columns. And then they reduced this to only 10 pages. 10 pages is not that much, because CEC, the conference uh, sponsored by IEEE, uh, takes papers of eight pages, double column. So it's only two pages more. And in multi-objective, 10 pages is nothing, because they ask you lots of tables and plots and all this. So you have to submit supplementary material. And sometimes supplementary material is much more than the paper. 
It's like all your results are in this supplementary material. Well, it's probably okay because nobody likes to read all these tables. They want to read the algorithm. It's probably okay. But, but this has created, of course, a problem in terms of the uh, not being so clear or so comprehensive sometimes when writing a paper in these in this top journals. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the way it is. Evolutionary computation is even worse because evolutionary computation only, they don't have a, such a big backlog, but they only publish four issues in the year. It's according to the seasons. They have a spring, winter, uh, fall, and, and the issues are, I don't know how many pages, but they publish about six papers in this issue. It's just evolutionary computation doesn't receive that many submissions, not as the transactions. There are, of course, journals that are a lot worse. The European Journal of Operational Research, the last time I checked, because uh, I know some of the editors, like Roman Slovinsky, they were receiving about 2,000 papers a year. So the backlog was one and a half years. So once your paper got accepted, it will take one and a half years to get published. And review process takes forever in, the, in, in that journal, like one year or more. Yeah, there are journals that are worse. ACN Computing Surveys is, at some point, it was the highest uh, impact factor journal in computer science. They sent me for review a paper once. In the year, I think it was the year 2014. And the paper had been submitted in the year 2008. So by the time they sent it to me, everything in the paper was obsolete. I think the author had even forgotten about the paper. You know? <laughs> Four years later, they send you a, a review. It's like, what the hell is this? You know? I didn't even remember I had submitted a paper to this journal. So some journals are really terrible for, for the review process. And this is very bad for students because uh, also for faculty. I don't know in India, but in Mexico, we get a lot of pressure to, to publish. Like me, I, I don't have that problem. But for young faculty, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And, and if you submit to a journal that takes two, three, four years to just review the paper and tell you it's rejected after four <laughs> years, it's, it's not a good thing, right? It's, it, it's really bad. But there are journals that are very fast. So uh, yeah, this is just like a summary of the things we, we saw. Some of the main uh, points about performance indicators. So binary indicators, as I said, are not very popular today. I, I mentioned the coverage of two sets, how it works, and an epsilon indicator. The epsilon indicator, some people have used, but it's more popular the other one, this one. Coverage of two sets is, is much more popular than, than the epsilon indicator, for reasons that are unknown to me. Uh, and as I mentioned, the main problem is how to compare results. If you are only comparing two algorithms, it's not much of a deal. The problem is if you compare more than two, because then you will have to do all the pairwise comparisons. And it will require, and in the two directions. So it's many, many results, many tables. And perhaps at the end, you cannot conclude anything. That's the worst part. You, know, you, you put a lot of effort, and, and final conclusion is, I'm not worse than the others, but I'm not better either. So. But I know some people who are very good. Even if their algorithm is garbage, they manage to publish the algorithm. That requires really a lot of, they are bullshit masters. There are some people who are very good at that. Yeah, I won't, I won't move to the, uh, to the next lecture because we are already doing very well in terms of time because we were supposed to do some performance indicators tomorrow, but we are pretty much done. So I don't know if you have any, uh, any other questions. Some people were asking me in the place about some code. Uh, if you go, this is the EMO repository. In the EMO repository, in uh, JMetal CPP, if you go to JMetal CPP, this is the version of JMetal in C. And in here, you are going to find. Uh, Let me see. 
algorithms right here. You're going to have a find several algorithms, including some algorithms we developed, like uh, OMOPSO is one we developed, and SMMPSO. This is better than OMOPSO. SMSIMOA. And there is a version of SMMPSO based on hypervolume. Now, the funny thing is they don't have the same algorithms in the two versions of J-Metal. I think this version has more algorithms, the one in Java. The one in Java has quite a few additional algorithms. You see, it has quite a few. Like DMOPSO, DMOPSO is a MOPSO we develop based on the composition. Uh, the indicator base, MO cell is, is a cellular algorithm. It's the only cellular algorithm I know that is multi objective. There are several versions of MOIA D, NSGA2, and so on. But in the EMO repository, you will find also uh, there must be a version of NSGA3. There is one in MATLAB. There is one, I don't know if we have it here. I, I told you of a guy in Taiwan. A guy in Taiwan has, uh, you go to Google and put NSGA3, you will find it. Because I think it's the only guy who has it. Because if you try to implement this algorithm, it's, <laughs> it's complicated. Well, that's what my students say. I haven't done an implementation in, in a long time. This is MATLAB. Yeah. In Python, oh, Jesus Christ. The war is coming to an end. Yeah, this is the guy. Yeah, it's uh, Sun She Xiang. I will never be able to memorize that name. That's, that's the guy who... Uh, put his implementation. So something very interesting is uh, if you try to implement the algorithm based on the paper, is very challenging, not necessarily because it's difficult to implement, although it is difficult, but because Kalyan on purpose removed one portion of the algorithm. One portion is not explained in the paper. So this part, you have to figure it out. So of course, there is more than one possibility on how to implement that part. That's pretty obvious, right? It turns out, I believe, some people develop implementations, like one of my students has an implementation, that are better than the original algorithm. But there is no way of knowing that. So how do we validate if the implementation is correct? Very simple. You go to the paper. Use the same test problems, plot the Pareto fronts produced by your implementation, and see if they sort of look like the ones in the paper. If they look about the same, yeah, OK, it's OK. It's probably totally wrong, right? But it's an evolutionary algorithm. What the hell? So you will trust your implementation. So this guy, he says, this is my validation. Uh, he has identified some issues. Actually, it's a, a revised version because uh, the revised version is in 2016. He had some errors. This code we used some years ago, and he had some, some mistakes. But in, in my course on, on IMO, which, as I mentioned before, is a, it's a PhD course, uh, I'm very tough with these guys. So they have to implement NSGA2. They have, NSGA3, they have like uh, two, two or three weeks to implement. And they have to read many papers, and they have to at the end, the project, they have to do uh, a, a contribution to the field. So they write a paper, and I am the referee of this paper. If I consider the paper will be accepted in a major conference, then the project is acceptable. Otherwise, they flunk. If I consider the paper will be rejected in a, in a major conference. But it's OK. You know, normally, they don't, they don't flunk. But sometimes, they, they, 
they present some weird, strange ideas. But yeah, this algorithm is, is, is difficult to implement. It's different. This is meant for many of them. So for the key of the key, we should use that as That's what Calvin says. <laughs> yeah, I would use more here, but you can use energy to do it. Energy to is very easy to do. I believe energy A3, if you, if you solve a problem with two three objectives, it works very much like energy A3. Although, in this case, it uses reference points. Somebody was asking about reference points. The idea of reference points is to guide itself. If you read the paper of the energy A3, what they mention is that the algorithm is meant to be used with problems of up to 50 objectives. One fact, 50 objectives. I don't know why. I think this has to do with the reference points. But you know, if it's many objectives, it should work with any number of objectives. That's what the papers say. Don't ask me why. You see Kalyan asking why they say. But that's what the papers say. But uh, it's rarely the case that people use benchmarks with more than 10. It's very, very nice. Energy A3, at least this implementation, because as I said, we don't know if any of these implementations is correct. According to Kalyan, all of them are wrong. That is true, I don't know. But uh, it's not that difficult to outperform the system. It's a good algorithm, but it's not as good as in its time we had you know, we had energy two. Energy two was very difficult to that time. It was good. But this algorithm came a little bit late because when energy three was was uh, proposed, we already had Moria D, we had SMSC more, and these are very, very powerful. So and Moria D, for example, is very difficult to also, much more difficult than energy. A. And Moria D can work with any number of objectives. The only problem is, as you increase the number of objectives, you have to increase the population size. The increase is linear. It's not exponential, but still you need more solutions. So that's the only limitation. That is not the case of energy. A. So this is the implementation that most people use. And if, if you were asked what your advice would be implemented, my advice is take a look at this code. So for two or three objectives, how many, uh, how many solutions are sufficient for Moyerdi and how, how many? You have to read the paper. There is a methodology. You have to read the paper. In the paper, they say, they give a formula. This is not a number you guess. There is a formula. Because it depends on the number of weights. They advise you to use between one and three solutions for each weight. So if you have, for example, 100 weights, you will need between 100 and 300 solutions. But sometimes you will get some really strange numbers, like uh, 725 solutions. This is what you need to use. This is a very strange number. So you need to read the, uh, the paper. Don't, don't try to, uh, to make up a number. Why does it say it's in use? Ah, because I, I left this open. Okay, so if you don't have any, any further questions, that's all from my side.